So earlier in the course, we looked at solving quadratic equations and different ways to do that. We're now looking at quadratic functions and their properties, and we're gonna be graphing these quadratic functions. We are gonna use some of the techniques that we had seen with transformations of graphs. So let's look at the following. It tells us that a quadratic function is a function in the form f of x is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, where a and b, a, b, and c are real numbers. No questions? And we have to put on the stipulation that A cannot be zero. If A is zero, then this is not a quadratic equation. It would be linear. So A cannot be zero. If we're looking at the domain of a quadratic function, the domain of a quadratic function is all real numbers. And we can express that in interval notation as negative infinity to infinity. Well, I think I've already stated it, but it says, why does the definition above say a can't be zero? What type of function would f of x equals ax squared plus bx be if a was equal to zero? Well, if a was equal to zero, we would have the function f of x equals bx plus c. And then this would be a linear function and not quadratic. Okay, so we've talked about being familiar with certain graphs. We know a graph of the square function f equals x squared. Let me just pause and let me mute everybody. If you have a question, then please come in and, and ask. Apologize. So um, we are now looking at the graph of x squared and we've looked at that before. And we also know how to transform it by properties that we've learned in that section 3.5 in our book. So let's use these properties and some new terminology to explore quadratic equations. So recall the graph of a quadratic function, we call that a parabola. The value of a, actually tells us the direction our parabola is going to be facing. If our value of a is bigger than zero, the graph of our quadratic is concave up. So what that tells me is basically the parabola is facing upwards. You'll be looking at concavity more when you get into calculus and not all functions are concave up or just concave down. They could have concavity in different spots, different intervals. If your value of A, the coefficient in front of X squared is less than zero, when we say the graph of the quadratic is concave down, which means that the parabola is facing downwards. The highest point of our parabola is called the vertex. And the vertical line that passes through the vertex vertical line that passes through the vertex is called the axis of symmetry. Um, it asks us why is that line called the axis of symmetry? <laughs> Excuse me. 
And that is because if we folded the paper on that vertical line and it would be symmetrical across this. So the parabola is symmetrical across this line. So there's two different options that we can go about with graphing these parabolas. Let's first look at using transformations. Okay, so option one, they're calling using transformations. First thing that we wanna do, if it's not already given to us, we wanna put our quadratic um, equation in this vertex form. So option one for graphing a function f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Again, a can't be zero. First thing that we want to do is we want to complete the square for x to write the quadratic function in this vertex form. So the vertex form is this f of x equals a, then parentheses, Inside the parentheses is x minus h and the parentheses that quantity x minus h is squared plus k. And then from there, notice that we can use transformations of functions. And let's just talk about that really quickly before we move on and why we see the transformations of functions when it's in that vertex form. So if I was looking at my parent function, right, which was y equals x squared, and we look at this, that minus h that's inside that parentheses, that would be like plugging in x minus h wherever I saw an x right here. And so since that's the case, that minus h, remember that shifts our graph horizontally. And that minus h, this shifts the graph to the opposite direction than we would think. This one shifts it to the right H units. So it shifts to the right H units. So I'll look at that value of A in front. So remember that value of A in front, that coefficient in front of the X squared, that's what's gonna be stretching or compressing it. And it also could be, depending on the sign, could be a reflection across our, um, that's gonna change my Y value. So that would be a reflection across the X axis. So this is gonna, this A value, this can stretch. I spelled that wrong, stretch. or compress the graph vertically. It also could, again, by the value of A, it could be a reflection across the x-axis. And that's if our value of A again was a negative number. And then this plus K outside, that's affecting our graph vertically. And so the plus K, this shifts the graph up vertically. So this shifts the graph. Up k units. Okay, so when it's in that form, we can see the transformations that are going to be going on with our parent function of x squared.
And that's just kind of a reminder of what we had done in our previous class. So let's look at the following example and let's put it in that form and then let's graph it. So the following example we're given, um, we have f of x is equal to negative 2x squared plus 6x plus 2. So when we apply the completing the square method here, we're going to do it a little differently than we had done before. Sometimes we just isolated before our x terms on one side and got the constant on the other. But this is a function we have that, that y value or the f of x value in there. Let me just give myself a little more room. Okay. So we want to complete the square on this. Recall in order to complete the square that that coefficient in front of the x squared has to be one. And it's not one here. So we can do a couple of things. You can either divide everything through by negative two, and then we'll, at the end we'll um, multiply everything through by negative two. Or normally what I do is I factor out the coefficient in front of the x squared out of all the x terms. So if we do that, and we pull out this negative two just from the x terms, we would be left with x squared plus, actually not plus, right? Because I pulled out a negative. So minus 3x. Okay, the thing is that this is not a perfect square inside, but I'm gonna have this parentheses soon. So I'm gonna just leave some room in here because we were gonna add a number in here to make this a perfect square. Let's pretend, or not pretend, we're just gonna do it. We're gonna add zero in here, but we're gonna write zero in a funky way. And so let's put it here. So let's say plus blank minus blank. So when we pulled that negative two out of just the X terms, we still have our constant here of plus two that we're gonna bring down. Make this a perfect square. Recall, we're looking for the same number we add to give us negative three. That same number we're gonna multiply to give us that constant. So we're halving negative three. Well, halving negative three is, is negative 1.5. And if we square negative 1.5, I'm, I'm gonna write it as halving negative three. To me, it's easier if I think of this as a fraction. So if I half negative three, I can write this as negative three over two. Well, I know negative three halves plus negative three halves is negative three. I wanna square this term negative three halves times negative three halves to me is nine fourths. So adding nine fourths would make those first three terms in the parentheses a perfect square. But if I add nine fourths, I really wanted to add zero. So I'm gonna subtract nine fourths here. Okay, but I really don't want that negative nine fourths in that side, that parentheses, because that's not making that a perfect square. So I technically need to move this negative nine fourths outside the parentheses, but I just can't take negative nine fourths outside the parentheses because of this negative two, right? There's this negative two out here, and that negative two has to be distributed to each term. So in order to pull out this negative nine fourths, I'm actually gonna to have to multiply it by negative two. So let's just do that and then write it outside of the parentheses. So we still have this negative two out front. So we have f of x equals it's negative two. We're keeping the first three terms, x squared minus three x plus nine fourths inside the parentheses. 
but taking out that negative nine fourths, I have to multiply that by negative two. I'm just gonna write it like this, times negative nine fourths. And then I still have this plus two outside. So I notice I can clean this up a little bit. Notice that two and four, that negative two times negative nine fourths, that simplifies. They both have a two in common. So two goes into itself once and four twice. I also notice that I'm going to have to add these two terms outside the parentheses. And so I'm going to need a common denominator. So at the same time, let's multiply this two by two over two to get a common denominator. So we have f of x is equal to negative two whole point of everything we just did was to rewrite this as a perfect square. So x squared minus 3x plus 9 fourths is now a perfect square. So the same number we add to give us negative 3 and multiply to give us negative or positive 9 fourths is negative 3 halves. So x minus 3 halves quantity squared. And then let's combine those constants outside of that quantity squared. So right here, negative times negative. So we have a positive 9 halves plus a, this is a 4 halves. So 9 halves plus 4 halves, that is going to give me a 13 halves. OK, so I can see what my vertex is, and I can see what, and we didn't even talk about that yet, did we? That's OK. Um, I can see what's it shift, shifting and transformations. So looking at this, I see that minus 3 halves. That is a horizontal transformation that minus three halves in there, this tells me we're gonna shift y equals x squared to the right three halves units. And this minus two here, well that negative, that's like negative x squared, this is a reflection across the x-axis. And it's a vertical stretch. Because of the two. And lastly, that plus three halves outside of that parentheses that is affecting it vertically. <clears throat> so this is going to be a vertical shift up three half units. So if you think about it and do our transformations, our original function looked like this, y equals x squared. Let's do it in order. The shifting to the right three halves units, that's 1.5, I'm just gonna estimate it. So shifting it to the right, three and a half is this. So this is y equals x minus three halves quantity squared. That minus two, that minus is going to reflect it across the x-axis. And so doing that first just looks like this. So this is y equals negative 
x minus 3 halves quantity squared. That um, 2, that 2 is vertically stretching this. So it's making it skinnier at a slower rate. And then lastly, this plus 3 halves, so same thing as 6.5, this is shifting it up 6.5 units. Okay, so here that we were at three halves, and now we're going to shift it up 6.5. So about right here. So I have a general shape, general idea. I can get some more values by plotting some more points and finding my intercepts. Let's see if there's questions on that one. And actually let's find some of those intercepts. So a couple of things we know, right? Just to get a better accurate graph. Um, if we look at finding our y-intercept, we know that's when x is zero. I can plug it into my original equation, so that would be the easiest way, is plugging in zero wherever I saw an x in this f of x. So I get negative two all times zero squared plus six times zero plus two. So I see I have a y-intercept at two. Looking at our x-intercept, or intercepts, this is when y is equal to zero. Sometimes we don't have x-intercepts, but knowing where the the vertex is in which direction our parabola is facing, we can tell if they're gonna have them or not. So I know because it's above the x-axis and it's facing downwards, then that's gonna have to cross the x-axis and it's gonna cross twice. If for some reason it wasn't gonna cross and you didn't see that, then algebraically when you solve, you're gonna get a complex number, an imaginary number. Okay, so x-intercept, we can use that original function, but I also noticed that I, if I use my function we just manipulated to get in vertex form, I can use that square root method, which probably would come out faster. So looking at that, we have f of x, we're setting x equal to zero. So we would have this negative two all times x minus three halves quantity squared plus three halves, we're looking at when is this equal to zero? Myself some more room. So if I wanna use that square root method, I wanna subtract three halves on both sides. So if I subtract three halves on both sides, I have negative two all times x minus 3 halves quantity squared is equal to negative 3 halves. Well, let's get rid of the negative 2 in front of the parentheses. And we can do that. Let's multiply both sides. That's easier than dividing. Multiply both sides by negative 1 half. So doing that, we're left with just the parentheses x minus 3 halves 
quantity squared on the left equals, well, negative 3 halves times negative 1 half, that's positive 3 fourths. Now I can use my square root method. Taking the square root of both sides, I would get x minus 3 halves is equal to, don't forget the plus or minus, the square root of 3 fourths. Well, the square root of a fraction is equal to the square root of the numerator, so square root of three, all over the square root of the denominator. So square root of four, I can write as just two. Get x by itself, we would add three halves. Notice when we add three halves to both sides, we already have a common denominator. So I can write this as three plus or minus root three, all over our common denominator of two. If when you're doing homework, they ask for the exact form, and if they ask you, see if they want you to put it as a point or just the x value. If they want it as the exact form and as a point, we would write this as three minus root three all over two comma zero, and three plus root three all over two comma zero. But the whole point for me to doing this was so that I would have a little bit an easier graph or more accurate graph. To me, th three minus root three over two doesn't tell me much. And so it would help me if I'm gonna graph this to find out an approximation. So three minus root three all divided by two. Add an extra parenthesis in here. And so doing that, we get X is approximately in here 0 0.6, 0. And then 3 plus square root of 3 divided by 2. This gives me about 2.4 comma 0. Okay, so let's look at plotting that a little better now that we know that. Um, so I'm just thinking three halves and it was five and a half. Now I lost that one page, here it is. Okay, so plotting this, I'm just gonna make this bigger. We had a point at 1.5 and 5.5. So that was right here. We found the y-intercept was at zero two and there's something wrong. I noticed that I should have gotten a negative number. So let me just make sure I might not have added enough parentheses there. So three minus square root of three, divide that by two. Yep. Let me just pause for a sec and I'll explain why I think there's an error. Um, I think there's an error because of this, where this, this x-intercept is, unless that should have been a negative two. Let me just go back up. Shouldn't have been a negative two. So let me look at, and I'll come back and tell you where my error was if I find it. Okay, so when I was bringing my function down, f of x here. I wrote three halves instead of 13 halves. So this right here should have had a one. So that would have been a 13 halves, which is gonna change. So when I add, I would have subtracted 13 halves on both sides. And then when I multiply negative 13 halves times this negative one halves, that would have been positive 13 fourths. 
So the square root of 13 fourths. So the only thing that's different is that this should be the square root of 13 instead of the square root of three. Okay, so if that is the case, three minus the square root of 13, divide it by two. Oops, I need parentheses or it's gonna not be right. Okay, and that's what I knew. I knew it had to be a negative number. So that actually, if we were looking at it, this now is approximately negative 0 0.30, which makes more sense to me because this is where the y intercept was and this is where it's gonna to have to cross. Did I start the video? Yes, I did, okay. Um, and then that three plus, so parentheses, three plus square root of three, end your parentheses, not three, 13. End your parentheses, divide it by two. So that gives us about 3.3. comma zero. Okay, so here is our graph of our function f of x. So notice that vertical line that goes through the vertex, that's what we called was the axis of symmetry. So this vertical line, I'm just going to make it dotted here. So recall vertical lines are in the form x equals. So the axis of symmetry is the line x equals 3 halves. OK, let me pause. OK, so the next example, same idea. We're going to take our function f of x, which in this case is 2x squared minus 4x plus 1. And we're going to rewrite this in vertex form. Once it's in vertex form, we're going to use those transformations to graph. So again, in order to complete the square, to put it in vertex form, that coefficient in front of x squared always has to be positive 1 to complete the square. So the first thing that you want to do if it's not 1, is we want to factor it out of just the x terms. And so if we do that, we can rewrite f of x is equal to, so pulling it out the 2 from just the x terms, we're going to have 2 times the quantity x squared minus 2x. I'm going to be adding something in here and subtracting something in here. I'm going to be adding a zero in here, just in a different way. Oops, I said zero, so I wrote it. In our parentheses, and then we have that constant, that plus one outside the parentheses. So we're trying to figure out what number we need to add to make this a perfect square. So it's the same number that you would add to get negative two. You take that same number you would add to get negative two and multiply it by itself. So half that B value, half that B value is negative one. So negative one plus negative one is negative two. Now we need negative one times negative one to be that constant. And negative one times negative one is adding a one. But we're just really adding zero inside this parentheses. And so instead of just adding a one, we want to subtract a one. Those first three terms inside the parentheses is the perfect square. So we really don't want that minus one inside that parentheses. So I need to move it outside of the parentheses, but I need to make sure before I move it out, I multiply it by this two. That's in front. So we have f of x is equal to this two all times x squared minus two x plus one in the parentheses, 
And so two times this negative one here, this is really minus two outside of this parentheses. And then that plus one. So the perfect square, x squared minus two x plus one, we can rewrite as x minus one quantity squared. And then outside we have negative two plus one. So this is minus one. So looking at transformations, and when you're on an exam and you're doing one of these, you might wanna list out, especially if it's an in-class exam, you might wanna list out the transformations that you're going to give. Because if you just graphed it and you got it wrong, then I can't give you partial credit. But if you list out what you're doing and why, then I can give you some partial credit. So this minus one inside here, this shifts to the right. one unit. The two out front, it's positive. So I know my parabola is facing upwards, um, but it's gonna be a vertical stretch. It's gonna make it skinnier. And this minus one, that's gonna tell me that I'm shifting it down one. Okay, so my vertex was at zero, zero, move it to the right one and down one. So if I do that, this vertex point zero zero to the right one and down one would be right here. I can take other points and I can do that, or let's just look at, if I look at my y-intercept, plugging in zero here, f of zero gives us back one. So I know I have a y-intercept at positive one. My axis of symmetry is gonna go through that vertex. So basically, if I know I have a point at zero, one, and I flip it across this line, x equals one, notice I know another point, right? That other point here is gonna be at two, one. It's a reflection. Let's just figure out what our x-intercepts are. And I can see because it's facing upwards and where the vertex is, which is in quadrant four, that it's gonna to have to cross the x-axis twice. And so let's look at that. Um, I think it's easier, unless you can see how to factor it, um, it's easier to use that form that we had just done, especially if you write it down correctly. Um, and so writing it down, we're gonna find the x-intercept by setting our function equal to zero. So we have two times x minus one quantity squared minus one is equal to zero. Let's add one to both sides and divide by two. So we get x minus one quantity squared equals one divided by two, one half. Take the square root of both sides, so we get x minus one equals plus or minus the square root of one half. Well, square root of one is one all over the square root of two. Before we add the one to both sides, we don't like radicals in the denominator. And so we can rationalize that denominator. So we're just multiplying by a fancy one in order to get rid of that radical in the denominator. So I think to myself, what can I multiply square root of two by? It has to be a square root so that it's a perfect square underneath the denominator. Well, square root of two times square root of two um, gives, gives me square root of four, which is two. So I get X minus one is equal to plus or minus the square root of two all over two. Let's add one to both sides. And I would get a common denominator. So instead of writing it as one, that's two halves. And so my 
fraction is now going to be x equals 2 plus or minus root 2 all over 2. So 2 plus root 2 all divided by 2. That gives me about 1.7. And two minus root two, all that in parentheses, divide that by two, we get approximately 0 0.3. So 1.7 and 0 0.3. Okay, so we now have the graph of our function. So before we move on, let me see if there's any questions. Okay, so we have properties of graphs of a quadratic function. If it's in the form of f of x equals a all time, um, times x squared, then plus bx plus c, where a is not zero, the vertex. So if it's in this form, we can actually use what is called this vertex formula. And the vertex that you would get is negative b all over 2a. That is the x value of the vertex. Well, the y value of that vertex, we can go back in and take what we found for x and plug it back in to our function wherever we see an x. So this would be f of negative b over 2a. Okay, any questions? Remember that was going through the vertex. And if it's going through the vertex and it's a vertical, it has to be the x value of that vertex. So the axis of symmetry is always gonna be the x value of our vertex. So x equals negative b over 2a. We say the parabola is facing upwards and the parabola is concave up. Recall if our coefficient a was bigger than zero. If the parabola is facing upwards, notice what type of point that vertex is. That vertex is the minimum point on the graph. So the vertex is a minimum. So remember we called, uh, talked about local maximum, local minimums, absolute max, absolute mins. In this case, this is actually going to be the smallest point you'll ever get. So this would be considered an absolute minimum point. A parabola concave down. So a parabola facing downwards, that coefficient in front of the x squared, a, we said had to be less than zero. So the vertex in this case, notice is a maximum point. If we had looked at this and it was in vertex, um, sorry, standard form, vertex form of a parabola. So if it had been f of x equals a all times x minus h quantity squared plus k, we can see that the vertex by transformations was h comma k. And depending on what A was depends on if it was a max or a min. The axis of symmetry in this case is X equals H.
So now let's use that to help us graph. So looking at our next example, it says graph a quadratic function using its vertex, um, axes, and intercepts. And then we're gonna graph. So graph f of x equals negative x squared plus four x minus seven by determining whether the graph is concave up or concave down by finding the vertex axis of symmetry, y-intercepts and x-intercepts if they exist. So let's look at this, let's find our vertex. We have that vertex formula, our x value of the vertex, which I like to call h, is equal to negative b over 2a. So if I look at my b value here, that is four. So I would have negative four all over two times a, and a in this case is negative one. So simplifying that negative four over negative two would be positive two. And so I know the h value, my vertex is two, I can find the k value by looking at what f of two is. So go in here, wherever we see an x, we're gonna plug in two. So this is equal to negative, we have two squared plus four all times two minus seven. So this is negative, two squared is four. So negative four plus four times two is eight minus seven. So negative four plus eight is four, four minus seven is negative three. So my K value of my vertex is negative three. And so now we know what our vertex is. So our vertex is at two, negative three. Notice that, and I'm gonna save myself a lot of work. Notice that A, my A value for this quadratic equation, A is equal to negative one, which means my parabola is concave down. It's facing downwards. So if I'm thinking about where my vertex is and I think about what direction my parabola faces, notice that this is not gonna cross the x-axis. And so I can save some time by not even looking for the x-intercept. I can find the y-intercept and that's really easy. I just plug in zero for x and I get back that my point is um, zero negative seven. Notice that we have our axis of symmetry. Is that vertical line X equals two. And so since we know what that Y intercept is, we should also know the point that is symmetrical across this line X equals two. Well, notice the distance between here vertically, this is two, which means I need to go over to this direction to get my other point. So because I know that zero negative seven was a point, I also know four negative seven also has to be a point. And so now we have the graph So no x-intercepts. <coughs> Excuse me. So if the vertex HK and one additional point on the graph of a quadratic function, f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a doesn't equal zero, are known, then the vertex form of f 
plank can be used to obtain the quadratic formula. And I believe that they want that. This is F equals A all times X minus H quantity squared plus K. <coughs> Basically, if we know what our vertex is, we know what H is and we know what K is. If we know a point, then we know what our X value is and we know what our Y value is. And so we have enough information in here that we could go in and figure out what that coefficient of A is. And then once we know what A is, we have that quadratic equation. So let's use that information for our next example. <coughs> so find the quadratic function given the vertex in one point, determine the quadratic function whose graph has a vertex of negative two, five, and passes through the point zero, negative seven. Okay, so I know that I have a vertex is negative two, five. So I know what my um, H value is of my vertex. That's negative two. And I know that K is five. So right now, what I have is F of X equals A all times X minus H, which is negative two quantity squared plus K, so plus five. Just cleaning it up a little bit. F of X equals A all times X plus two, quantity squared plus five. So let's go in here and let's plug in what we know with our point. So in here, we know that X equals zero when um, then y is negative seven. So let's go in here. Y is negative seven is equal to a all times x, which was zero plus two quantity squared plus five. So we have negative seven is equal to a all times zero plus two is two and two squared is four. So a times four plus five. So let's solve for a, we would subtract the five on both sides. It's negative seven minus five is negative 12 equals four a divide by four. We get a is negative three. So knowing what a is, knowing what our vertex is, we have our equation in vertex form. So we have f of x is equal to our a value, which is negative three, all times x minus h, which we saw was x plus two, quantity squared plus k, <clears throat> which is plus five. So that's the vertex form. If they wanted the standard form where it was ax squared plus bx plus c, that's where you're gonna to have to expand out that x plus two times x plus two and then distribute the negative three combined like terms. Okay, so now if your vertex or if a is greater than zero, the vertex is a minimum point on the parabola, since the parabola is concave up, this means that this is, that blank is a minimum value of f. Um, I'm just gonna guess what they have here, but let me just make sure. Um, the vertex is the minimum point. Um, this means the y value 
is the minimum value of f. Remember when we're looking at the minimum and maximum value, we were looking at the, the y value. The x value told us where it occurred, but the y value is actually the minimum. If a is less than zero, our parabola is facing down. The vertex is a maximum point of the parabola. And that means the y value of the vertex is the maximum value of f. So to make this a little more accurate, this y value, well, it's a y value of the vertex. So remember that y value of the vertex we can find by finding the x value of the vertex and plugging it in wherever we see an x. So f of negative b over 2a. That is the minimum value. If a is less than zero, again, that x value, or sorry, the y value of our vertex is the maximum value of our function. So we can find that by looking at f of negative b over 2a again. We're almost done with this section, so let me just finish it off and then we'll take a break. We have one more example to do. So last example says, let's find the maximum minimum value of a quadratic function. Determine whether the quadratic function f of x equals negative x squared plus 4x has a maximum or minimum value. And then we want to find that max or min value. Well, if you look at our function f of x, notice that our value of a is less than zero. So a equals negative one, a is less than zero. So I know my parabola faces downward. So we're gonna have a maximum value f of x has a maximum value. And we want to find out what that maximum value is, and that's the y value of our vertex. So we can find that y value of our vertex. First, we need to find negative b over 2a, and that's the x value of our vertex. So negative b, so negative 4, all over 2 times a, which is negative 1. So this gives us back positive 2. So we now want to look at what is f of 2. So let's go in here. Wherever we see an x, we're going to plug in 2. So we have negative parentheses 2 squared plus 4 times 2 plus 5. So 2 squared is 4 with a negative in front. We have negative 4. 4 times 2 is 8 plus 5. So negative four plus eight is four, four plus five is nine. So the y value of the vertex is nine. So we have a maximum value of nine. Okay, so that is 4.3. So graphing quadratic equations, being aware of the terminology behind graphing quadratic equations, you should be able to look at it using the vertex form. So putting it in that form, you can think of it as using transformations when it's, a, it's in that form, or you can look at finding the vertex using that vertex formula, negative b over 2a comma f of negative b over 2a and then go through and find our intercepts like we've done in the past.